This is a presentation of the Topsfield Historical Society. Thanks for coming. Uh, we have an interesting uh, presentation tonight. Our speaker is Amy Goss, and uh, she's here to present an interesting story of Elizabeth Howe. That's H O W, not H O W E. Uh, and Elizabeth was one of three women from this town. Who was accused and subsequently hanged uh, in the Salem witch trials in the early 1690s, that 1692 specifically. Now, for us, there's there's even a greater connection because uh, Elizabeth was a member, uh, well, most surely was a member of uh, Parson Capon's congregation uh, here in Topsfield. Our speaker, Tammy, uh, is a native of Louisiana, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And has lived in uh, both Ipswich and in the North African nation of Libya, and I understand uh, is intending to retire uh, in Ipswich with her husband. Okay. Now, as part of this event, uh, there are some books on display on that uh, table uh, to my right. You might want to check those out at, at the end of the lecture. Uh, and before we go on, I just want to remind people that in November we will learn about the injustices and controversies in the court system, the judicial court system here in New England, which I understand is going to be an, I should be an eye-opener. Uh, so I would, I would invite you to uh, come back in November, and of course in December we will have the uh, annual Christmas holiday party. And so uh, at this time, I want you to welcome, join me in welcoming Tammy Goss. Okay? I can thank everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Tammy Thomas, and I'm speaking tonight about Elizabeth Howe, a local resident accused as a witch and hung in Salem in 1692. I will talk about what led me to research her life and the discovery on my property. First, I would like to introduce John James, my dearest friend, who has worked relentlessly with me on this project, and Don and I will be presenting together tonight, so thank you, Don. And I'd also like to recognize the Topsfield Historical Society for their generous donation to this project and for inviting us to speak with you tonight about our project. Also, um, a big thank you to Mr. Norm Eisler for all his generous help. And on a personal note, I'd like to say how very lucky Topsfield is to have Norm as their president. Behind me are the names of all the great folks that have devoted their time and energy to help out in this project. So a big thank you to all of you, and particularly to my husband, Phil, for all his help and support, and um, he wasn't able to be with us here tonight. So who well, was... I mentioned the uh, yes. bouquet that he did send you. Oh, yes. But he's here, and he sent me flowers. So I thought, well, if I brought the flowers, I would think of him being here tonight. research have gone into this project, and not to exceed our time here tonight, I will touch on the main points, providing you with some information about Elizabeth's history and the find on our property four years ago this October. Most of this research was gathered from old original wills, land records, town records, old maps, birth, marriage, and death records, as well as the 1682 Abraham Howe Family Account Book which is now in the possession of the Ipswich Historical Society. Also, significant information was taken from the works of Martin Van Buren Curley, a local historian who was born and grew up in the Ipswich Farms area. He wrote articles published in the Essex Institute Historical Collections and in 1906, a very well-documented 750-page Curley family history here, I have a copy of it here, and most importantly to our find of the likely Elizabeth Howe home site was a book he wrote titled Miss Elizabeth Howe's Trial. It was published in 1911. It documented in great detail the location he had personally seen. Both of these books are on display tonight along with the artifacts. 
And just a quick note, it should be noted that several people I mentioned in my talk tonight have the same first names, and it can get a bit confusing. It was very common practice back then for the parents to name, use their own names for their firstborn child, so it gets a little confusing. We'll try not to confuse you. Um, so, who is Elizabeth Jackson Howe? During the witchcraft hysteria of 1692, three women who attended the Topsfield Parish Meeting House were charged with practicing witchcraft and ultimately hung. They were Elizabeth Howe from nearby Ipswich Farms, Mary Esty, and Sarah Wiles, both from Topsfield. Elizabeth Jackson Howe was born to Joanne and William Jackson in Hunsley, a hamlet in Raleigh Parish, Yorkshire, England. She was baptized the 14th of May, 1637. The family sailed to America from Hull, England, on the ship John, accompanied by the Puritan minister Ezekiel Rogers, arriving at Salem in the harbor, Salem Harbor in the fall of 1638. As Puritans, their belief was to purify the Church of England and that all traces of Catholicism had to be removed in order for God's blessing to be bestowed upon them. So by leaving England and helping to set up a new colony in America, they would demonstrate the teachings of the Bible through establishing their own form of religion, government, and society. So after arriving in Salem, after arriving in Salem, shortly afterwards, in 1639, this group of people settled in an area first known as Rogers Plantation, and later it was named Rowley. And that was after the parish in England where the minister, Ezekiel Rogers, was from. The Jackson settled on a small plot of land in Rowley, which today would be known as Bradford Street. Documents suggest that Elizabeth, as a child, may have worked in the Reverend Rogers household as a companion to his wife, as well as tending to domestic chores. So who was Elizabeth's husband, James Howe, Jr.? James Howe, Jr. was born of James Howe, Sr. and Elizabeth Dane in the village of Hockrell, near Bishop Stortford, Essex County, England, in early 1633. Most of the Howe family were living in the nearby village of Hatfield Grotto. This is a photo of a parish church built in 1076. It's located in Hatfield Grotto, where the Howe family attended. In 1635, James Howe Jr. accompanied his family, along with his maternal grandparents, John and Elizabeth Dane, to America. They, too, were seeking the same religious freedom as the Rowley group. The two families first settled in Roxbury, which is an area of Boston. And by 1641, they left Roxbury and moved to Ipswich and settled in the town very near to each other, in, in the town of Ipswich. Ten years later, in 1651, James Howe Sr. was granted 100 acres of upland, formerly known as the Norton Reserves, this area of land bordered Topsville and Rally and was located about six miles west of the main town of Ipswich. Don't wait, hang on a second. So you can see where the how um, name is up here. That that area right there was all incorporated that hundred acres up there. And then it shows where the Curleys had acreage here. This was the town commons where Baker's Pond, which is now Fitz Pond up here, and you can see all the borders like that. Okay, so James Howe Sr. built his home on this land around 1651. At that time, this area of the land became known as Ipswich Farms or the Farms. Much later in 1746, Ipswich Farms was incorporated as a territorial parish and named Lineford Parish. James Howe Jr. met and courted Elizabeth Jackson of Raleigh, and on April 13, 1658, they were married. James's father, James Sr., gave his son land near his own home on which to build his house. James Howe Jr. and Elizabeth had six children, James, Elizabeth, Mary, Deborah, John, and Abigail. James died around six years old, and John died 
around 28, and the other four children lived to an old age. James Jr. and Elizabeth were probably farmers. Records show they tended their apple orchard and did other farming work. And being strict Puritans, they were required to attend meeting house or face strict punishment. Elizabeth and James Jr. attended the first Hopsville meeting house, which was located on what today is named Meeting House Lane, and later the second meeting house ministered by Parson Joseph Cavan. The people living in Ipswich Farms had an agreement with Ipswich that would allow them to attend the meeting house in Topsville and not have to pay double rates. They attended Topsville because it was much closer, it was only two miles, whereas Ipswich, to go to Ipswich was six. And Norm, I'm just going to stop a minute. Can you find, does everybody know where the old uh, meeting house was? Would it's you like me to point that out? It's on Tower Street. Can you find I think it? everyone here would probably is, is uh, Does anybody want me to show them where that is? Meeting, everyone here would know where the dry bridge is, so called. Mm -hmm. Where Route 1 crosses uh, Howlett Street. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were to head east on Howlett Street, down the hill. Because I don't think we marked it on that. You'll come to Meeting House Lane. Yeah, it's on the left. On the left. Goes up. Yeah. To, uh, Certain yeah, there's no evidence there of any meeting house at this point. And the second one was? The second cemetery. one was in the Pine Grove Cemetery. Okay, the, the cemetery that you passed up on 97? Right, off 97. I meant to put that in there. Got it. Okay. All right. So what led to Elizabeth being accused and hung as a witch in 1692? In, 16, in 1692, during the time of the witch hysteria in Salem Village, many people in surrounding towns were being accused and examined for practicing witchcraft. In Elizabeth's case, certain events and gossip over a 10-year period prior to the witch trials in 1692 ultimately led to her arrest and later to her death. One interesting fact was that Elizabeth's husband was nearly blind and later became totally blind his condition may have required Elizabeth to tend to duties not typical of a woman in those days, which could have led to idle talk, given that the Puritans were religious and very superstitious. So Alan Curley and his family settled in Ipswich Farms and were neighbors to the house. And just before the, the where they were living is where the, to the left, this red star, the house were up there, the Samuel and Ruth Curley were living there. Alan Curley's son, Samuel, and his wife, Ruth, who were living there, were also living at Ipswich Farms. <coughs> Samuel and Ruth gave incriminating testimony against Elizabeth Jackson Howe, testifying that in 1682, they having some differences between James Howe Jr. and his wife, Elizabeth, and that being shortly afterwards, their 10-year-old daughter, Hannah, began having strange fits. They also testified that when Hannah came out of these fits, she blamed Elizabeth for her affliction. The trial records recorded by Reverend Samuel Paris reveal several testimonies from people, some of which spoke for Elizabeth's innocence, and some, including members of her own husband's family, spoke against her. One interesting testimony was by Reverend Payson of Raleigh, who witnessed one of Hannah's fits. Hannah, after coming out of this fit, was asked by the Reverend if Elizabeth had caused this to her, and she replied that if she had accused Elizabeth of afflicting her, she, she was not aware of it. And so three years later, in 1685, Hannah pined away with skin and bone, and she died. And 10 years later, in 1692, Elizabeth Howe would be caught up in the Salem Village witch hysteria. One interesting note I wanted to say was that it was never Hannah accusing Elizabeth of harming her. It was always the parents testifying that Hannah had told them that. These events ultimately led to the arrest of Elizabeth on May 28, 1692, where she stood trial in Salem for practicing witchcraft. Some of the same girls, which began all this hysteria in Salem Village, accused Elizabeth of afflicting them, as well as having fits during her trial. Elizabeth was found guilty of practicing witchcraft and sent to jail in Boston to await her sentence. 
families of the accused were required to provide maintenance to these prisoners. Elizabeth's husband, who was totally blind, was accompanied by his daughters, Mary and Abigail. They traveled twice a week, 30 miles each way to Boston in order to provide for her. Elizabeth Jackson Howe was accused of witchcraft and hung in Salem, July 19, 1692. She was hung alongside Rebecca Nurse, Sarah Wiles, Susanna Martin, and Sarah Good. They were the first group of women sent to their death in Salem. So, Elizabeth's probable home site find. A few years ago, my husband and I purchased land to build our vacation and retirement home. We began the building of our home in October of 2005. During the construction, I found old bottles and debris scattered around from the nearby 1840 home of William and Eliza Hawk Burley. I was constantly picking up old items as I found them interesting. In a different area, I found some brick and what I thought to be a piece of chimney flue. I put, I put some pieces of this aside along with the rest of my treasures. Shortly afterwards, my neighbor was telling me about Elizabeth Howe and that this area was their old property. This interested me, this interested me and I decided to visit the Ipswich Library Town Archives for more information on this family. In the archives, I happened to stumble across a drawing in a book by Victorial Ipswich by Curley. And this drawing was of the old William Curley homestead, which included the property we purchased, and it referenced the location of the cellar hole known as Mary's Hole, believed to be Elizabeth's home. Mary was Elizabeth's oldest daughter who inherited the house along with her sister Abigail. After further research, I located documentation which gave exact measurements and reference points of this cellar hole. This location was exactly where I found the brick and what was determined later to be regular pottery, not a chimney flue fragment as I first thought. In the following spring, my friend Dawn and I decided to investigate this area by digging quite a large hole. <laughs> Quite a large hole, and we began to find brick, clamshell, nails, clay, pipe fragments, window glass, and many other items, which appeared to be some sort of fireplace remains. I then went to the Massachusetts Historical Commission in the town of Ipswich with my find and spoke to the committee. They believed this was something significant, and with their best efforts, generously funded a professional archaeological report, which was conducted by archaeologist consultant Barbara Donahue, and then it was submitted to the town of Ipswich, as well as the state of Massachusetts. And in the summer of 2008, Barbara and her team volunteered some of their time to work on this site. We continued the excavation, exposing three sides of the cellar hole and many more artifacts, including over 800 pounds of brick. It was indeed a great find, and today we have removed all the artifacts for preservation, and we plan to donate these artifacts to the town of Ipswich and Topsfield for everyone to enjoy. The cellar walls have been left intact, and the site has been covered for preservation, and the location of the cellar has been recorded for future reference. So now, I thank you, and, and I guess now we're just going to show you guys some pictures and talk about it and answer questions. And, as you can see, what, what was left on the original property wasn't very deep at all. We don't even have a foot here, and look at all the brick that was here. Now this was an old apple orchard and it was covered over with a lot of brush when Tammy bought it. And it was very uneven um, property. But with her, her daughter had given her a metal detector for Christmas and that's what started this on this hunt. It still works. <laughs> it, it's the best thing. And 800 the nails later, it still works. <laughs> Every time we found a nail, we found for it. But what was very interesting here also, we decided, how do, how do we decide where we're going to start digging? Because we kept making all these test holes to find things. So we went away from this area, saw what the original property looked like, 
once we started digging down what we got to, and then we kept coming back here because not only did we find brick, we found this clay, dark clay earth that was decomposed something, and there was always brick and mortar and, or clamshell issue with it, and um, glass and nails. So this hole started getting a little bit bigger, and we got a little bit closer to our house. And um, that's when we decided that we really should probably get some experts in here because her children really didn't want to help. You see, that's how I very early shifted all that. We shifted every single pile of her story. Yes. And we were bucking, using buckets. This is small. It's not that big yet. It, but it's <laughs> here's, wow. And this is what kept us going, our little treasures, this piece of clay pottery. And as you'll see, there's quite a bit in there. We haven't found a whole piece. But um, this was enough to keep us going. This is from the ladies' house? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it kept getting deeper, as you can see. And a little bit deeper. A lot of this and, um, up here is builder's dirt, because they put some builder's dirt on this, too. And that's what we're getting confused, because of her house being built and the way that they had leveled it off. So we had we kept coming back to this spot though, but as you can see we had in some places um over six feet of this. Yeah. But you'll see that. So um this was one of our fun summer afternoons. And here's a piece of brick with that clay um a not clay but clamshell. And was that between it, was it on it? I mean it was so hard because there's so many bricks. And then when we got the real archaeologists that had the real tools, they knew how to. We didn't do this, but they did. But it was kind of interesting because now we're seeing the actual cellar walls. Now, if they got married in 1658, is that when they first built this house? So is this house from 1658? Is this Solid wall from 1658. It's still there under the ground, and there's no mortar holding it together. It's just stones with dirt. It, it was just really incredible and really exciting. And there's just a couple different views of this. And you can see where the stone came from. This, this stone was so large, we couldn't lift it out. It just kept getting moved yeah, around. We just kept moving it around. <laughs> they, we, there was five of us in the down there. there. Yeah. It, it, it's still there. It was just like there. But you can see where all this stone came from off the original property because there is a stone, um, what do you want to call it, hill behind you, where all this stone comes from. So you can see right. how they got uh, uh, Come on, everybody looks for What do you call the, gravel? behind you, the knoll? Someone said knoll. Right. You know, the granite, is it granite? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> you know, there's just, yeah. but to give you an idea. It was all over the place. What they make the walls and stuff with? This is the archaeologist who had all the right tools. So yeah, he's you can see it. And there's still because there's dirt. This is the ground level, and this is look how deep it's cool. yeah. so far we've gotten down here. And it's it's cool. laughing because you know how hard it took. <laughs> but it is pointy. It kept getting bigger. Every time our husband would come home, we keep saying, "Where are the gophers in the backyard?" <laughs> there was a lot of dirt. And as you can see, all three um, sides. Now are behind us. Yeah. And what was really incredible, we have some close up of the corners. Yeah. But just, there were stones that were placed on a diagonal. I, to me, that was just, it, it's just amazing that it's still there because there was a huge crane sitting on here digging out her basement. So, this was really well built. Mm -hmm. But isn't, I mean, look at how cool it is. It is just so cool. This was the this one. And this is the lead that was just kind of on it. Yes. It's about four feet. <coughs> what was it, four feet? About four feet. Four feet yeah. there. The tallest part. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, that was before we had all the stone. It's stone, but we had to keep moving all the way. Really, we couldn't get it out of there. We needed a crane to And this is what we're using, just these paint bars. <laughs> But as you can see, all the way down there was, there was brick all the way through this. 
And this is, if, if these were the stone walls, this is standing with our back towards the three walls and looking forward. We're trying to go further, but there was so much dirt there and that was a big work. house, so we couldn't go much further. And here's some of our treasures. Mm -hmm. Kimmy, you want to talk about what you have here? Does that cell eventually get done out? Eventually? It won't even get done with this. There's a, there's only three. Well, you, there, we don't have the four side. No, it was um, during the building it got damaged. It's gone. It's gone. But we we have all the artifacts that were in there, and we left the the, the walls that were still there are still there. We left in there and we recovered it all. Just took out. So we have metal in there, so we can find it again with a metal detector. Oh. So we'll be able yeah. to find it. But as you can see, there's window pane glass. There's a yes. uh, either a shoe bubble mm -hmm. or this a golf bubble. Window glass. This is a spoon. This mm -hmm. is probably case ball glass. This is clay pipe. Mm -hmm. This is a buckle. Mm -hmm. This is a spur. Knife handle there. Mm -hmm. This this kind of stuff. This I forget. What do you? Help, what is it called? Mm -hmm. Somebody help me out here. Okay. The white right. stuff that you find. Is this porcelain? No. Chris, the, oh gosh, it'll come to me later. But I, you know, this is probably just, I mean, you've got to remember when we started digging, when they build your home, when they take the top layer of your topsoil off and save it, and they're going to respread it in that area. And so, you know, this, a lot of this, this, this kind of stuff, which pearl wear, thank you, that's what it we, we don't know if it was from that time or just something that got spread on the top. But we certainly know the things that we pulled out, which were deeper. They had weights by the stirrup. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a, the stuff's over in that case, so some of that. We figured this was probably a weight. It's a very heavy piece of metal. So we couldn't find it first. It's it's lead. Yes. It's lead. And it was very heavy, so we figured it was used as a weight because she was a herbalist. So was she measuring with this? You know, is what we were wondering. We, we okay. It, it was the hardest thing to find. I mean, we found it. It's hard to figure out what it was. That's just some of the bread. Just some of the bread. We, the, spoon, the, the spoon, we just kind of, we're looking at, what's the date? It's 1650, 1650 is what we have from this book. If you can tell, you know, from the, you can date spoons and stuff, certainly, because of the shapes, the handle, the, the balls, and the looking shape. So um, that was about that time of year. Would, would these have been, utensils uh, have been made in England, probably? It, it could, yeah, it certainly could have been. Of course, this one, this one, it was broken on this. This corner is broken. It's in the case of it. This corner is broken, and this is kind of bent up. And you know, but it's probably just got discarded. Or, we it only found one spoon and one handle. handle. It was some something. Maybe, maybe they, they did it to label something. Yeah. Well, when you see it, you yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's just next. This, we're not sure what it is. It's not been cleaned up yet, but we took this out really far down, and it appears to be some kind of door latch or handle. This, this section right here is wood. The wood was still intact in it. It was like, it's, it's struggling to survive right now, but I'm hoping that um, there's somebody that can take a look at it and figure out what it, what it was. And you can see where the nails were put through on the actual piece, too. Yeah. Because they're still... There's like a little two nail. Yeah. And the way it, it's a latch of some sort. So, and this is a rock that it attached itself to it. <laughs> which I left below and it. The handle broke now. But, okay. And so this is... Okay. This is pretty much what got disturbed right here. This is what we... Have. This is 12 feet here, this measurement, this is to the outside of this wall that we found, and we got this far, seven foot four inches, and we lost it. It's all gone. It was, it was damaged. It was gone. It was taken away. So, this is south, this is north. If, if it was a, like a 12 by 16 house, this just seems to fit. If you were to, you know, like what we were finding, this is when we got to here. It, that's it. 
it was doing something on this corner we couldn't tell because it was so high over our head with this caving in on us. And this this part right here, this part was very, very, very deep, all up in here. This was appeared to be packed with smaller rock, which was taken out. And so I don't know. I mean, I'm looking at thinking, I guess they'll just have to. Yeah, we're not sure what to make of, you know, what happened here, but we really believe that was the chimney just because of all the brick and the way we found the brick. The way it fell in. And the way we found a whole bunch of, what did we, um, like ash pockets in that area as well. And unfortunately, her house is now there, so knowing that most houses face south, the, and what we had in the back, it was, this is south. Exactly south. And, you know, what, typically those little hot, like, um, Chris, um, can I call on you? Because these guys are building the little house. Chris Doctor and his wife Gail are involved in building the, the small house that's going up in Ipswich next to the visitor center. And it's a little 12 by 16 house. And that was from 1630 something when they first were here. But right. And so if you ever get a chance to go see this project, it's really cool what we're doing. And, um, Maybe you can kind of visualize that maybe something like this. It, it, it typically, they, if it was south, they would have entered, the door would have been here, and immediately in front of this chimney, which would have just been like solid earth that they didn't excavate, so they would actually you come in, and there would be little stairs that go to sleeping loft or whatever. So this would have been solid ground. This would not have been excavated. What would have been excavated for this type of house, if it was, would have been going from, let's see if I get this right, here, across, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there, you know, and all down here. So it would have been like this. And this would have been ground. And it was kind of strange because this corner right here is where that huge stone came from, and there were two more which we didn't, just, they were huge. We just yeah. didn't. And right on this, this corner, right here, almost like it was meant to be there as a support for something. So we don't know. So we're waiting for somebody to figure this out. So that's it. That's, let's, what else we got to show them? It's what we have. Where's the, where's the house on where it is? No. <laughs> well, we did. Well, here, right now, let me just stick it in my just real quick. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> what I, I have to tell you, this is the most exciting thing I did <laughs> for the last two summers. Okay. Uh, oh, we didn't even talk. Didn't even talk. Okay. So, we actually have measurements from this, and there's a, 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 this, that's a square. This well is still in existence. Yes, with this picture, the, the measurements from this picture, this is the well which is still there today. And, there, and the measurements were taken from that well which is still there. And go to the next <coughs> And it was, I can't remember, 196 feet. So basically, there's the well. And it was over the knoll, northeast. And this number three is where the solar hole, that's where we're digging, right there. And this was a tree reference, which is not, obviously not there anymore. Um, this, this right here, this old, um, where it's got this X there, that um, was the Ab that was the house you saw prior, built by Lieutenant Abraham, ha Abraham Howell, who was, um, it gets very confusing. I, I, mean, I could so go, and then there's talk in all the history of these people, but anyhow, that was where that house was, and it's no longer there today. It's been replaced. Go back to the next one. It's been replaced. There used to be an old barn back here, which was probably their barn that they were using. That barn was taken down and removed and replaced. The house was taken down, and the barn was moved here. And by... William and Eliza Curley, who lived in this house. And basically, the barn that's there today on our road is a listed building as having timbers from an original barn of 1711. 
that, well, actually, yeah, probably. He's probably older than that. So, but anyway, so that's where it was, and this is some of the information where he had, he lived out there, he had seen it, and then he, it was documented in the historical Essex uh, collection. He was he wrote a lot of articles, historical articles, and uh, then he gave all the measurements, and it is dead on to what we're finding. So, I mean, all I can say is, I mean, I'd like to stand here and say with 100% certainty that it is her house, but I can't because, you know, we didn't pull out anything that said Elizabeth Howe on it. But typically, when you have families that live on these properties for so long, and you hear it from one generation, you know, I mean, they knew where everybody lived. And so, of course, it was always known as that, because that's probably what it was, you know? And there's nothing, nobody else has ever lived out there. And it's just, uh, it's just, and Mary and Abigail were living in it, and they, that was the daughters, and they sold the property, they, they, they went, moved back to Raleigh, and whether the house just was probably taken down and recycled, all that brick and stuff, and just left there. It's been there all those years. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all the, you know, if you ever go up that road, I mean, all those old walls are original property lines and stuff, so. Yeah. <laughs> Because we have so much reference points. We have artifacts, we have maps, we have oh, we've all sorts of documentation. It's just, it's Somebody's just got to prove it differently. Because I don't think that anybody would have built that structure underneath that we dug off those walls that are still there. But For you know, what? it wasn't, it wasn't, a lot, it wasn't much. You know, you, you would think that a cellar of you're going to find all these treasures down there and stuff. That doesn't, I mean, just doesn't happen. You know, maybe someday I'll be doing something else and you uncover something, you know, a trash pit or something. Right? Right. You just don't, but you can't go, like, dig up your whole yard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would. <laughs>